to welcome you to Wednesday Bible Study here at Second Baptist Church of Richmond. Our current study is called Galatians in Slow Motion. We are investigating the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians slowly, carefully, verse by verse. Today, we find ourselves in Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14. Let's begin with Galatians 3, 10. For all who are of works of the law are under a curse. For it has been written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and do all the things written in the book of the law. Paul plunges into a direct argument against relying on the law. The Greek term translated for connects verses 10 through 14 to the previous discussion in verses 6 through 9, which emphasizes that Abraham's righteousness resulted from his faith rather than his works of the Old Testament law. The phrase, all who are of works of the law, signals those who ground their identity in the law and rely on law observance to obtain righteousness. Although they seek a right relationship with God, this group, says Paul, is actually under a curse. In verse 10, the classic Jewish dichotomy of blessing and curse comes fully into play. In verse 9, Paul speaks of the blessing bestowed on those who have the faith of Abraham. And in verse 10, he speaks of a curse that falls on those who rely on works of the law. Evidently, the false teachers were teaching the Galatians that those who undergo circumcision share Abraham's blessing, while the uncircumcised do not. In a remarkable rejoinder, Paul argues that uncircumcised Gentiles who have faith in Christ share Abraham's blessing, while those who rely on the law and receive circumcision are under a curse. In Paul's mind, a person relies on either works of the law or faith. These are mutually exclusive categories that are as different as curse and blessing. Paul quotes Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed is everyone who does not observe and do all the things written in the book of the law. The challenge of discerning what Paul means here has eventuated substantial disagreement and divergence among modern Bible scholars. One strand of interpretation, which is represented by Bible scholar Richard Longenecker, goes like this. It's probable that the false teachers had cited Deuteronomy 27, 26 to convey that those who do not observe the law are cursed. Thus, they said, Gentile believers in Christ must undergo circumcision. In response, Paul quotes the same scripture, but emphasizes instead that those who do not observe all the law are cursed. Overall, then, the false teachers had said, you have to observe the law or you are cursed. And Paul replied, no, that passage says you have to observe all the law or you are cursed. And since no one can observe all the law perfectly, if you rely on the law in the first place, you are inescapably cursed. This interpretation follows the long-standing majority view that Paul assumed it was impossible to keep the entire law. In this view, Paul would agree with James 2.10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. A second strand of interpretation, represented by Bible scholar Richard Hayes, goes like this. If Paul had believed it was impossible to keep the entire law, he would not have said in Philippians 3.6 that he was blameless as to righteousness under the law. According to this view, while Paul did not regard himself as having perfectly obeyed every single commandment in God's law, he called himself blameless because he was generally above reproach and because he had benefited from the law's provisions of repentance and forgiveness and atoning sacrifices for sin. This line of interpretation does not assume the law is impossible to obey. 
nor that anyone who tried to obey it was inescapably cursed. Instead, it suggests that the quote from Deuteronomy 27:26 evokes a large section in Deuteronomy in which obedience to the law brings blessings and disobedience brings curses. Look at Deuteronomy 28 through 30. The point, says Hayes, is that those who ground their identity in the law, quote, live under Deuteronomy's dispensation of conditional curses and blessings to be subject to strict judgment contingent on obedience, end quote. This line of interpretation also stresses that the covenant was for a community to keep, and therefore the curse applied to the whole people rather than strictly to individuals. Overall then, in this view, Paul was essentially saying, if you affiliate yourself with those who place their hope in obeying the law, you are joining a losing team. Not because obedience is theoretically impossible, but because Israel historically has failed and has in fact incurred the judgment of which Deuteronomy solemnly warned specifically by being sent into exile. The first line of interpretation represented by Longenecker makes a great deal of sense. The second line of interpretation represented by Hayes features thoughtful reflection and perspectives, but does not make as much sense of the curse in the quote from Deuteronomy 27:26. Therefore, I follow the first line of interpretation. But with this caveat, Paul is not undermining a legalistic effort to obey the Ten Commandments and thereby earn enough moral points to get into heaven. He is rather undermining a legalistic effort to require Gentile, that's non-Jewish Christians, to adhere to aspects of the law that distinguish Jews from Gentiles, especially circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath observance. I would add that even if one could keep the entire law perfect, this would produce a bogus righteousness. The thrust of Philippians 3, 6 through 11 is that Paul was just as righteous under the law's standards as anyone else. But the righteousness he obtained through the law amounts to what he calls rubbish compared to knowing Christ. In Philippians 3, 9, Paul distinguishes between righteousness based on the law and righteousness based on faith, indicating that only the latter, righteousness based on faith, is authentic. Likewise, in Romans 10.3, Paul distinguishes between the righteousness of God and the righteousness humans try to establish through the law. In Paul's view, the righteousness of God is bestowed on those with faith in Christ not on those of the law. In light of all this, then, the basic point of Galatians 3.10 was that Gentile Christians who received circumcision incurred the curse of Deuteronomy 27.26. To be cursed is to be cut off from God. Paul is claiming that those who rely on the law to obtain righteousness actually end up cutting themselves off from God, excluding themselves from the covenant community. The point evokes the many ways in which Christian attempts to be righteous can paradoxically function to distance us from God rather than draw us closer to God. For example, when our moral scrutiny becomes so exacting that it produces self-righteous condemnation of others instead of humble love for others, we may be closer to curse than blessing. When we hurry past a person in need to go spend an hour reading the Bible, we may be closer to curse than blessing. When we are so certain about our theological and ethical beliefs that we are quick to dismiss the perspectives of others and reluctant to learn anything new, we may be closer to curse than blessing. When our main focus turns away from the grace of Christ, toward a pursuit of our own righteousness, we may be veering off the course Christ has laid out for us. I'm reminded of a man who pastored a church in the same community where I used to pastor. 
a young couple came to him and asked him to marry them. They wanted to seek God, get their life on track, and get involved in church. When the pastor found out that they were living together out of wedlock, he said they were living in sin and he refused to conduct their wedding. Although I am a proponent of couples getting married before they move in together, when I heard about this, I remember thinking to myself, this doesn't make sense. If he would just marry them, then they wouldn't be living together out of wedlock anymore. He could actually solve their dilemma instead of compounding it if he wasn't such a stickler. In speaking against the law, Paul is especially resisting the idea that Gentile Christians should observe the external marks of Jewish identity laid out in the law, such as circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath observance. This point challenges us to remember that we who rely on faith in Christ do not rely on external markers of spiritual identity. Our identity in Christ is not grounded in being a clean-cut individual or in displaying a Jesus is Lord bumper sticker on our car. It's not found in shopping at Christian bookstores or wearing church clothes on Sundays. It's found in faith, which expresses itself through love. Now for verse 11. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous one will live by faith. As Longenecker notes, the passive grammatical construction, translated, is justified, serves to accentuate righteousness as bestowed by another rather than as achieved by one's own effort. Indeed, Paul uses the divine passive to indicate that God is the one who justifies us by grace. He is conveying that the gift of righteousness is not offered through the law, nor is one set right in God's sight by following the law. This is all quite clear to Paul because of a statement he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous one will live by faith. This is the second of four Old Testament verses that Paul quotes in verses 10 through 14, but it may be first in terms of importance. Alongside the lucid statement in Galatians, Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, stands the clarion call in Habakkuk that the righteous one will live by faith. These are the twin pillars on which Paul builds his biblical case for the doctrine of justification by faith. One text confirms Paul's doctrine in the Old Testament law. The other confirms it in the Old Testament prophets. These two verses are also prominent in Romans, where Paul similarly argues for justification by faith. In Habakkuk 2, 4, righteousness has nothing to do with observing the law and everything to do with faith. In its original literary context, the verse conveys that the righteous person is the one who demonstrates faith in God amid adverse circumstances. Some viewed the verse as a messianic prophecy because the Messiah was sometimes called the righteous one. Paul allows the messianic overtones to resound as he cites this verse to argue that the righteous person is the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Bible scholar C.H. Dodd suggested that Habakkuk 2.4 was probably a verse that early Christians used to support their belief that salvation is found in Jesus Christ. If this was the case, then Paul made a common Christian move in appealing to Habakkuk 2.4. However, he did so for the very specific purpose of refuting the false teachers in Galatia, who were insisting that law observance was essential for justification, the justification of Gentile Christians. According to Bible scholar Niels Dahl, in verse 11, Paul mirrors a common legal practice among ancient Jewish rabbis. When scriptures appeared to be contradictory or difficult to correlate, 
Rabbis often sought to identify the key principle in Scripture in light of which the other relevant Scriptures were to be understood. In modern day language, we might call this the process of identifying a hermeneutic key, or less formally, the central piece of the interpretation puzzle. For example, when Jesus was asked which commandment in the law was the greatest, he was invited to engage in a similar exercise. Notably, Jesus did not reject the man's question on the grounds that all of God's commandments are equal. Instead, Jesus identified Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In Leviticus 19, 18, You shall love your neighbor as yourself as the twin greatest commandments in the Old Testament law. He indicated that all 613 commandments from Genesis through Deuteronomy are to be understood in light of the commands to love God and love neighbor. Indeed, according to Matthew twenty-two forty, 40, the entire Old Testament is to be understood in light of the double love commandment, as St. Augustine called it. Perhaps Paul saw a contradiction between Deuteronomy 27, 26, the one who does the law will live by it, and Habakkuk 2, 4, the righteous one will live by faith. In any case, he entered the debate about what scriptures are most important in determining how a person is justified before God. While Jesus cited two verses about love, Paul cited two verses about faith, Genesis 15, 6 and Habakkuk 2, 4. In Galatians 3, 11, Paul identified Habakkuk 2, 4 as the hermeneutic key that solved the puzzle of how one is justified or declared righteous in God's sight. It happens by faith alone. In light of the fact that both Jesus and Paul adopted certain scriptures as hermeneutic keys that shed light on the whole of scripture, Modern-day Christians are wise to follow suit. We might start with the verses Jesus highlighted, which give us a hermeneutic of love. We might also incorporate Paul's key verses, which give us a hermeneutic of faith. We can discern other hermeneutic keys, or keys to biblical interpretation, by looking for instances in which the New Testament interprets the Old Testament, and treating such instances as examples for modern-day biblical interpretation. For instance, in Luke 24, 27, Jesus teaches two of his disciples all the things about himself in all the scriptures. We can glean from this that Christian biblical interpretation is to be centered on Jesus Christ. We can look for Jesus in every passage and regard him as the criterion for all biblical interpretation. If Jesus focused on how the scriptures witness to him, so can we. On to verse 12. But the law is not of faith. To the contrary, the one having done these things will live in them. Paul has just established through an appeal to Habakkuk 2.4 that righteousness comes by faith and not by the law. Here he drives the wedge between faith and law even deeper by explicitly stating the law is not of faith. In other words, the law is concerned with doing or observing or adhering to statutes, not with faith. One might counter that the law emphasizes doing things on the assumption of faith in God, but that would miss the Christocentric core of Paul's argument. The law does not have the power to justify, only faith in Christ justifies. The law does not set people right in God's eyes, only faith in Christ does. The law provides only a human form of righteousness, whereas faith in Christ provides the righteousness of God. Paul quotes Leviticus 18.5 to make his point. The one having done these things will live in them. This verse shows that the law is centered on doing things in the law and living by them, rather than trusting Christ and living by faith. It's the third 
of the four Old Testament scriptures that Paul references in Galatians 3, 10 through 14. Leviticus 18, 5 is Paul's proof text for the simple point that the law does not rely on faith, but on works. Yet Paul is not saying that Judaism does not rely on faith. In fact, his reinterpretation of the Abraham story based on Genesis 15, 6 conveys that Judaism is foundationally about trusting God rather than obeying the law. Paul is contending that Abraham, not Moses, is the key patriarch of Israel, and that Abraham was a man of God because of his faith, not because of his circumcision. This is related to Paul's comments in Romans 2, 28 through 29, where he says, For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. If the false teachers had grasped this point, we might not have the letter to the Galatians, because Paul may have had no need to write it. But since the false teachers in Galatia, and evidently certain Gentile Christians in Galatia as well, were advocating circumcision, for Gentile converts to Christ, Paul had to write a letter to show them that faith yields justification, not relying on the law and circumcision. The reason Paul believed this was because of Jesus Christ, especially because of his death on the cross. Which brings us to verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse on our behalf. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The first thing to realize here is that the phrase curse of the law does not mean that the law itself is a curse or that the law as a whole is cursed. To the contrary, the law is a good gift from God that serves important purposes and is to be upheld in proper perspective. The phrase curse of the law refers to the curse of that the law pronounces in Deuteronomy 27, 26. Here, Paul brings the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 27, 26 into conversation with the curse of crucifixion in Deuteronomy 21, 23. Although Deuteronomy 21, 23 originally addressed the importance of burying the corpses of those who had been crucified or impaled, by Paul's day, this passage was widely applied to people who were crucified by Rome. Bible scholar F.F. F. Bruce notes that Paul's correlation of these two verses about curses exemplifies the rabbinic interpretative principle of equal category, which holds that scriptures sharing a common term or concept can shed light on each other. Paul is using the curse of Deuteronomy 27-26 to shed light on the curse of Deuteronomy 21-23. Like any good biblical student, Paul uses scripture to interpret scripture. Deuteronomy 21-23 is the last of the four Old Testament scriptures Paul cites in Galatians 3, 10 through 14. And to understand the specifics of what he is saying here, it's important to remember just how scandalous the thought of a crucified Messiah would have been to first century Jewish persons. A crucified Christ would not have made any sense at all partly because Deuteronomy 21-23 says that anyone who is crucified or hung on a tree is cursed. Some think that this very verse played a decisive role in Paul's former zeal to persecute Christians. How could a cursed man be the Messiah? Sometime after Paul's experience on the Damascus Road, he had an answer. Christ became cursed on the cross in order to save us from the curse pronounced by the law. We were cursed because we fell short of obeying the law's standards. So Christ became a curse for us by dying on a shameful cross. Christ took away our curse by becoming a curse on our behalf. Paul makes a similar claim in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. According to Bible scholar Ann Jervis, verse 13 indicates that Christ 
took on the position of those under the law. He became accursed. The reason was so that we who were cut off from God might be brought near again and blessed. In short, he who was blessed became cursed so that we who were cursed might become blessed. The curse that Christ incurred on the cross was an exchange curse, whereby he took the curse of the law away from us and gave us the blessing of righteousness by faith instead. Christ takes our curse, our sin, and our death, and we take his blessing, his righteousness, and his life. Salvation in Christ, then, is clearly available apart from the law. According to Paul's reading of Deuteronomy, the law itself confirms it. Paul suggests that by becoming a curse on our behalf, Christ redeemed us. The Greek term translated redeemed is exagoras, a word used to describe the emancipation of a slave. The implication is that the law brings bondage, whereas faith brings freedom. Christ not only atones for our sin, but also liberates us from captivity. Paul viewed Christ's death as a ransom, much like Christ does in Mark 10, 45 where he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This theology is dramatized in Mark's passion narrative, wherein a murderer named Barabbas is released as Jesus Christ is condemned to death on a cross. The crowd that shouts for Jesus to be executed also shouts for Barabbas to be set free. We can almost see the chains falling off Barabbas as Jesus is sentenced to death instead. We can picture Christ and Barabbas passing by each other and brushing shoulders as Christ moves toward the cross and Barabbas moves toward freedom. Christ became the curse that Barabbas was supposed to incur. He took the cross Barabbas was supposed to bear. The name Barabbas literally means son of the father. And astute readers of Mark understand that Barabbas represents all children of God. We go free as Christ is bound. We are saved as Christ is crucified. We are blessed as Christ is cursed. And finally, verse 14. In order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ died on the cross and absorbed the curse on our behalf for two specific purposes. The first is so that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Paul traces the blessing of Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, to Abraham's faith that was credited to him as righteousness in Genesis 15, 6. And then straight to the first century Gentile Christians who put their faith in Jesus Christ. He essentially skips Moses and the law because Gentiles receive the blessings of Abraham apart from the law through faith in Christ, who redeemed them on the cross. Gentile Christians who refuse circumcision, therefore, are not cursed but blessed. They are heirs of Abraham's heritage of faith, including its blessedness and nearness to God. Particularly, they are heirs of Abraham's justification by faith, inheritors of the same righteousness that made Abraham acceptable to God. The second reason Christ died as a curse on our behalf is so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In Galatians 3, 1 through 5, Paul stressed that both justification and the Spirit are received by those who put faith in Christ. He returns to the theme of the Spirit in Galatians 3.14 to remind the Galatians that they have received not only Abraham's blessing and righteousness, but also the very Spirit of God. Paul is expanding the original promise God made to Abraham because nowhere in Genesis does God promise Abraham the blessing of the Spirit. How then did Paul come to link the promise with the Spirit? Perhaps Isaiah 44.3 played a role in his thinking. 
The verse says, I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing upon your offspring. This verse exhibits a classic case of Hebrew parallelism in which the spirit is correlated with God's promised blessing. Perhaps, just perhaps, Paul was interpreting the Abrahamic promise for Gentiles through the lens of Isaiah 44, 3, so that the Gentiles receive both blessing and the Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. The doctrine of justification by faith can seem like cheap grace that allows a person to be declared righteous by God and then live like a, 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 a terrible hellion all the same. But this overlooks Paul's repeated insistence that the person who exercises the faith of Abraham and is justified like Abraham and is blessed with Abraham also receives the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a free gift, no doubt, but a transforming gift as well. The Spirit disallows the continual abuse of God's grace by convicting us of sin, by empowering us to live uprightly, and by leading us to walk in God's way. As Bible scholar James D.G. Dunn puts it, Paul does not allow his theology of conversion or the Christian life to fall into an unbalanced emphasis on either formal relationship or spiritual experience. The two go together as two parts of the one whole. Yes, we are justified and blessed by faith, and we also receive the Spirit of God by faith who guides us into righteous living. That's all for today. I hope you will join us next time when we pick up in Galatians 3, verse 15. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you.